Hello. Good morning, afternoon, evening, whenever to you. Uh, I don't have anything particular streaming out. Actually, that's not true. I do have a particular thing to stream about. The reason why I am streaming about it instead of recording is because I'm here, I have the time, and I'm being lazy because if I stream it, I don't have to edit it after the fact. It's out into the ether and I can just let it go. Sometimes I like to edit things. Sometimes I like to try to throw things in there or I want to put it overlays or this, that, the other. I do enjoy editing to a certain extent, but I don't know if you know, just to go behind the curtain, at least for me, I don't pretend to have a particularly wonderful workflow, but if I make a 15 minute video, that's at least a couple of hours worth of editing. Whereas if I make an hour stream, it's essentially zero editing. So I can go on longer potentially but it still takes me less time to get it from my brain to you. Uh, the thing that caught my attention I want to talk about, and I don't have, I actually don't have my sound coming in, so I can't hear. So there's someone who's doing gardening, seems like right outside the window, so I apologize for that. If that is uh, getting through, I do have some noise cancellation going on here. Hopefully that's covering it. Any case, it's more distracting, I guess, to me than to you potentially. I'm not, uh, I'm not here to, to, to get in on the fudging dice, whether you should or shouldn't fudge dice. I am not a dice fudger by trade, but I am not going to chastise or you know, otherwise demean folks who use fudging. But uh, I often find in the discussions, I'm sure it happens on both sides. I'm probably more sensitive when I see that folks who are uh, dice fudger proponents dice fudging proponents, proponents of dice fudgery, perhaps, they will uh, come out with these sort of uh, it's almost parables, arguments, stories. And one came out that I hadn't heard before. I thought I would relate it here because I think it's interesting. And I think it it, it actually is, uh, it could be uh, more illustrative of different things if we pull it out of the dice fudging context. And that is a story of, and again, I don't know if this actually happened to someone, if they just kind of came up with it. It's made up, whatever. It's from the internet. Who the heck knows? But the, the story here is that someone was came across a D&D game in progress. They sort of get, they're looking at, they're, they're following the game from a little bit of a distance, maybe looking behind the DM screen a little bit, and the party is fighting a dragon, and the encounter ends, and the game ends, and the person comes up to the GM and says, hey, you know... I noticed you weren't keeping track of hit points or anything. How did you know when the fight was over? And the GM says when, and it was a dragon fight, I think. And the GM says, I knew that the fight was over when, with the dragon, when it became uninteresting. And I just think the story has this sort of smarmy, uh, self satisfied, this kind of self, uh, you know, kind of, Oh, oh, oh it's so, oh, oh, of course, because if you weren't, if you were following the hit points or following the dice, then this fight might go on forever and be a drudgery. But because I fudge the dice and I, I get to play it by, uh, by my ear as an expert GM, of course I could tell that when the fight becomes uninteresting, I know to end it. And oh, and aren't self, you know, I get to self congratulate and aren't I an amazing GM? Well, I think there's, and hey, you might be an amazing GM. Maybe you are. What I feel about it is there's a lot going on here that I, I kind of want to unpack. The, the first thing is, is that this might just be me. This might just be my approach. I'm not going to pretend that it's everyone's approach. I don't generally think of things as whether they're interesting or, or in an uninteresting. That's not my goal. My hope is that the game itself is interesting so that whatever's going on in the game is keeping people's interest and in that if something is, is, is boring, if they're in some kind of tedium that for some reason they can't escape themselves and combat can be one of those tediums that we can, we can talk about it. We can say, Hey, let's just, let's just make sure that we're all aligned in. We, do we really want to do this thing? Do we, you know, you, you guys are on a, for example, let's say a, an, a naval expedition, but they're finding that 
the things that are happening out on the ocean just aren't interesting or whatever it is, because I kind of think that, and I've mentioned this in my videos about hex crawling, or you shouldn't just force time at a snail's pace if nothing's going on. So if we're just on the high seas and I'm rolling up no encounters, I'm not going to sit there and go moment and make them play out moment to moment for days on end on the high scenes if there's no tension there, if nothing's going on, right? Just zip forward in time. And potentially the, the dragon encounter example could be seen in, in a similar light. But essentially, if in, in on the grand scheme of things, if things are boring, things are not interesting, then we should talk about that so that we can align ourselves on what we want to be doing, what is interesting, and let's let's get to that point. Going into a particular encounter, for me, my encounter, my job, I feel like as the referee, is to play the dragon as an individual who has needs, desires, right? Wants, they want to survive. They may want to win. They may want things and play that out, not to play it as a piece of content. Because I think it works differently. I might have a dragon do things. If I just want the dragon, if the, the dragon's goal is just to be interesting in a sense of in the retelling of a story or whatever, I may play it in vastly different ways than if I want the dragon to act as I think the dragon should act. To me, they're not the same. If the dragon just wants to be interesting and be memorable in some way, well, I could just do all kinds of crazy stuff and make sure it's memorable. They could start tap dancing. They could just do a pirouette and fart and fly up in the air and do the great. That stuff may be interesting, but it, to me, it's not, well, it's not the dragon, what the dragon wants to do. I, my, my kind of my goal on the encounter is I want to do what the dragon wants to do. And I hope that if that in itself is interesting in a different, in a different way, maybe not in a, in, in a way, maybe we not, may not be thinking of interesting in the same way in that, in that regard, right? What from a entertainment point of view in a particular moment might be different than from a more of a simulations point of view. Oh, the drag, this is what the dragon would do. As a player, for my thing, yes, the the stuff that's just entertaining on the surface, that's great. But what gets my brain going, what I like are those chess matches and trying to figure out who are doing things and why and what their motivations are and how I can get in there and 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 manipulate them for myself or get around. And that stuff really gets activated by the more simulationist side. The other thing is, is I get it that in combat, and I think this example wasn't really talking about OSR games as much as talking about kind of 5e, but it can happen in OSR games too. Combats can become a drag. There can reach a moment in the combat in which folks have sort of staked out their positions and then it's just hit, 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 hit. And there can be this kind of drudgery part or you've kind of had the setup and that's happened. You haven't reached the conclusion where things might get desperate. There's a, you could call it a middle area. And sometimes this middle area, and sometimes it could be the end too, depending on what's going on and what kind of creatures are happening and what's everything. And then it's just kind of, you're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until you get from, yeah, one, one, uh, some kind of threshold of hit points. One guy's got, or one side's got this many hit points, the other side's got this many, and it's that kind of race to the bottom. Sometimes it can actually be when you're looking at it, you're rolling the dice, you're seeing the way things are flowing, kind of a foregone conclusion of what's going to happen. It's just about a, a matter of time about getting there. It's clear that the party, because of their whatever their powers and everything else, is going to defeat this dragon. It's just a matter of are they going to do it in eight rounds or are they going to do it in four rounds? So you can think about, well, in that case, sure, why don't I just Cut to the chase. I'm just going to cut it, cut the cord and say, you know what? I know that they're going to take care of the dragon instead of having to go with that drudgery. I'm just going to go right to the conclusion, in which case maybe the dragon has one last thing it wants to whip out or maybe not. And I can decide or let the dice decide which player happens to get the felling blow and let's, let's be done with it. Right. And that would be kind of the example. The fight is no longer interesting. There are no longer interesting decisions being made. So let's cut it. And I don't necessarily have a problem with that. I, I guess where I'm coming at is this really isn't a fudging versus not fudging conversation in my mind, or at least it doesn't have to be. It really is as much about how you do the behavior of the creatures that a party may be, may be facing 
this can be come down to tactics. This can get come down to their morale. If you're looking at the GM and you're seeing, hey, the party is fighting this dragon. The dragon's whooped. And I know it. And it's just happening. And it's a matter of how fast it's going. Chances are the dragon realizes that too. Chances are the dragon in the actual combat, in the fiction is like, damn, I'm not hitting these guys as much as I need to. And they are slowly wearing me down. Much as a player would look at their character as they're just getting hit, maybe not for tons of damage, but enough that they can tell from the map that I'm getting hit more than I'm hitting the other guy. And I'm not hurting them as much as I think they're hurting me. I have to think about what am I going to do? The dragon should be thinking that same thing. And it doesn't have to wait until it gets down to, I can only take one more hit before it decides to change its plans or tactics or whatever. I would argue that what it really should be doing is once you've reached that point of we're in sort of a static established pattern, ask yourself as the dragon or whichever creature, why am I sitting in this pattern? They've got me surrounded and they're just starting to wail on me. Why am I here? Why am I doing this? I don't think I should be here. So I need to do something about it and then start doing those things. If you do that, then the combat suddenly isn't just these guys whacking each other. It maybe is the the combat turns into more of that chess match. And this really happened from the start. There's no reason why the dragon should wait to be surrounded and wailed upon before they think about, I don't want to be surrounded so that they can wail on me. So I need to keep moving around. I need to position myself where they can't hit me. Maybe I need to get, if there's an exit, maybe I need to be in that exit or some way to prevent guys from getting behind me. Maybe I have to be flying maybe i need to do some uh, use some other part of the environment to my advantage all those things should be happening as uh, the same way in which the players should be thinking about how they can use the environment to their advantage and the upshot of this is that you you should i think really be able to reduce down that doldrum area or even eliminate it once it becomes clear to the enemy that they're not winning then they should change their tactics. It shouldn't be, well, now we're just going to kind of play out the string. No. Uh, soldiers want to live. Animals want to live. Maybe if it's an undead or an ooze or something that really just has a one-track mind and they they just keep coming. Sure. Maybe in that way that there are going to be some exceptions where you look at it and you say, well, this ooze is unintelligent. All it does is flow forward. So this is going to keep flowing forward and maybe at that point you just say you've dissolved enough of it that the rest isn't a threat or something to move along yeah they're going to be exceptions for the most part most things have some sort of intelligence whether it's an animal level or even below animal level vegetable level i don't know level of intelligence and then ups and usually with all of those i think you find that there is some sort of survival instinct at some point it just goes hey I got I to gotta skate or do what I can or try to turn away or whatever it is to get out of danger because I want to live. However uh, primitive that instinct is, I think that everything has some instinct to live. If they are intelligent, it, gets, it can be more complicated, that decision-making process. But I, I think really the takeaway from these kind of stories is, is not that you need to fudge dice to remove the boring parts, or that if you don't fudge dice, you have doomed yourself to living through boring parts. But it's really drilling down and saying, why is this boring? If this combat is boring because everyone's just standing still, then maybe the guy shouldn't stand still. And here's where I would insert a little gaming thing, gaming, gameist element of, yes, we're trying to kind of simulate what it would be like to live in this kind of fantasy thing, but it is a game. And if it takes some of your enemies moving around, and if you're playing with opportunity attacks and they are going to become subject to that, or then that, that does kind of screw over their, mess up their, their action economy for a couple rounds and to kind of put them behind to move and make things more dynamic, I would say err in that direction. Even if it's maybe not in their best interest from a meta perspective, well, in the action economy, if I spend two rounds doing this, then I'm all of a sudden I'm behind, blah, 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 whatever. Put that to the side, to the fact that keeping things fluid. And if there really is nowhere to go and nothing to do, and you know that it's just eight rounds more of combat, why is this person going to keep fighting? That's where you start to try to back up, play defensively, maybe try to get uh, surrender, see if you could see if there's somebody you could talk to to say, hey, I want to give up. 
you know, you know, this is where the, uh, you know, the, 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 the agent would, would, would bite on the cyanide capsule, you know, potentially if they know they're, they're beaten and they don't want to give up. Maybe you could give your guys, if you think about, well, my creatures or these folks don't have some kind of escape mechanism or easy thing, right? Well, give them some, there's no reason why your, your goblins, orcs, other humans, elves, whoever these adversaries are, couldn't have things like smoke bombs or caltrops or oil things that they can toss and run. Again, using, depending on your system, using whatever double dash or whatever they need to do to try to get away or just, hey, look, sometimes you got to eat an opportunity attack to get into a better spot. Eat the opportunity attack and do that to give themselves some leg room to escape. And this does kind of bring up one of my pet peeves and when people always put their fights essentially in dead ends. So you have, you know, you come into the throne room, there's only one way out and it's behind the party. So basically these NPCs are just stuck. I think most of the time people would try to, you know, would try to put themselves in good spots to be able to get away. One of my favorite movies, Ronin, towards the beginning, Robert De Niro is, is chastising his fellow agents by basically saying like, hey, I'm not going in this tunnel because there's really no good way it's kind of, it's a trap, basically. If I go in there, I'm putting myself at a disadvantage, so I don't want to go in there, though he does end up going in there. The point is your creature should be thinking about this stuff. So in my long rambling, whatever way, what I'm trying to say is dice fudging could be good. Dice fudging can be bad. I'm not really here to, to make a comment on it, though. Again, I'm not a dice fudger, but the idea of the these encounters, you want to end them, or, or I, I think the idea overall that you want to, end or I would say transform an encounter when it becomes uninteresting is a good idea. But I would say I don't you don't have to look at it and I don't think you should look at it as this is something that's only enabled by dice fudging. You could do this stuff perfectly well in the fiction. You just have to be on top of A what your options are, B, you know, where you are in the fight, and then just see just have the I don't want to call it wherewithal, have the, just, you know, do it, right? I think sometimes we can get caught up in wanting to match efficiency with the players or wanting to be whatever. So we don't want to move guys away or do things that would reduce their challenge. Or we think, well, I don't want the fight to be boring, but I also planned for this encounter to take 45 minutes and it's only taken 10 minutes. So I'm going to keep going. I think that's where you get into trouble. I think where you bring in these meta concerns, that's where you end up going like, man, I, I planned out for this counter to be an hour, so I'm going to play it for an hour. Even if half of that hour is just boring, I'm just going to do it because I have a three-hour game plan and this is hour one. What I think is one of the, uh, to me, the power of OSR and kind of simpler systems is there's not, I don't feel like I have to plan as much. I can just have more notes I can, or I can plan more stuff more easily so that, I'm not worried about the time constraints, so I don't go into a fight thinking this fight with the dragon needs to be an hour. So if it ends in five minutes because they did something amazing or weird or whatever, hey, more power to them and they can move on to the next thing. But that means I'm not trapped because maybe that's really the trap is when you on a meta level as a GM have said, okay, I need 45 minutes for this encounter. Or this encounter needs to be 45 minutes. Then you lose a little bit of that sight of looking at it and seeing what it is moment to moment. Because you may be looking at it as you're chewing through time and you're thinking, oh, this is great. They're going to end right in an hour when I want to. You might lose sight of the fact that all your players, and again, being, and if you're playing remotely, this might be even more difficult, are bored and are starting to kind of become a, a disconnected or lose that immersion because it's just round after round after round of nothing happening. Well, how do you do that? You don't put in periods where nothing's happening. And if the dragon is stunk or stunk, if the dragon is essentially sunk after round three, they shouldn't wait till round 10 to try to get away. I would err, err on them being fast. If you recognize, and this could be particularly true in something like fifth edition, which happens often when you look at a CR and you think this is going to be this great challenge. And then you maybe haven't taken into consideration your party, the makeup or just other things, uh, their equipment, whatever, the action economy. And you think this is going to be a really hard challenge. And then that first round or two of combat, you're like, nope, the party is way going to kill them. Just maybe take them a little bit, but this encounter is essentially over. Then end it. You don't have to end it through fudging. 
have the dragon try to get away. Have it try to dictate terms for surrender. Have it, if you're playing kind of old school dragons with spells and things, or you have your dragons have spells, see what spells they have that they make it throw out there to buy themselves some time to, to do something. You don't just have to have them sit there for the, for the entire round. Let them be aggressive with their plan change. And I think, and that stuff I think does a few things. It, it really forces the party to, to to really be flexible on their strategy. If they're just used to just running guys up to a front line and sitting there and just thwacking as hard as they can for however many rounds something goes down, if that thing doesn't sit there to be thwacked, they've got to figure out what else to do. And it doesn't even have to be just if they're losing the fight. I've seen oftentimes where you have the front line will be here and the back line's here, or maybe like this, and the front line will move forward, then the back line sits back here, and the front line's fighting here, back line's here, and it basically just stays there until stuff dies. If whatever's in front of the front line all of a sudden ends around and comes to the back line, suddenly there are choices, maybe hard choices that have to be made for those different characters, particularly if there's multiple enemies. Well, you don't get there if you just get kind of static. So I would say, you know, be flexible, move your guys around, think as if you were them, which I think is always the goal as a GM, but it can sometimes get lost. If you are the dragon, think about what the dragon wants to do. Don't think of it in meta turns about how much time you invest in the encounter or how long you had put this encounter to last or what things it needs to, uh, uh, you know, uh, accomplish for something else. Just think about what would that dragon do? If that dragon has an item, let's say that the party needs and the dragon gets away. Yeah. Then the party's got to keep chasing it to get that item. That's great. I mean, that's fine. Right. It, it look at it like, well, now they're just going to have to spend more time with that dragon because the dragon's going to go. They're going to try to track it down. That's just more, that's just more adventure. To me, that's more good stuff, and I and it might and it might allow your players actually some of them to do things that maybe they had plans or ideas or just stuff, right? Maybe the the ranger or something that hasn't been able to use some of his tracking abilities because they haven't needed it. Suddenly that comes in. Maybe the cleric or the magic user has a new spell that they didn't really have a chance to use. They get to use it. You never know how this stuff's going to play out. So let it let it play out. Let it let it come out there. Use that stuff. So. As usual with these things, I see stuff on the internet. I want to talk about it. And this was that interesting dragon encounter that got me going. If you uh, just to recap, because I guess I'm already about 20 minutes in there. And I know some folks have joined since I started. I saw this on I think it was on Facebook. It was kind of a parable of how fudging dice allowed a GM to keep to run encounter just on just while it was interesting and be able to stop it before it became boring. And that kind of got me on a little bit of a thought of really what I think that parable could speak to beyond just the fact that fudging dice or not, which led me to think about you don't need to fudge dice to deal with the situation. You have lots of other tools to deal with them, but you have to be open to those tools and, and use them. And it seems simple. I think when I say some of the stuff, sometimes I feel like I'm saying stuff that everybody gets it. Yeah. Move your guys around, do these things, but I'm sometimes, and just surprised by we can lock ourselves in a certain very rigid ways of thinking just to give an example of that. I'll, this is a long time ago now, but I was on a forum and, and they were basically talking about using sort of an MMO strategy against a creature, which was essentially to, um, I forget the term of it was, where you basically could string them along. Somebody will uh, sort of remind me, you could basically, because this happens in MMOs, and I don't play a lot of MMOs, so I, you know I'm not up on all the lingo. Um, but you know, you, you could have one character could get aggro, and they could sort of hit the creature, and the creature would just start following this one player around because they would kind of, I guess, behind the scenes, they would have the highest number of aggro number, so they would just keep ah, saying thank you, Joel Anderson, a chat kiting, yes, kiting. They could kite this creature around. And they were just sure in their brain that, oh, look, I can do this thing where I can kite a creature around in, say, D&D. Oh, I got this big creature attacking me. I can just kite it. Kite, 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 kite. And I can, they had this weird thing where they could just run around like a circular room and just keep kiting this thing around and other people could do things. And I, I had to really just keep hammering it. Well, why does this thing have to be following you around the circuit that you're running? Why couldn't they cut across the center? Why couldn't they do something else? And they just couldn't they were just stuck on this MMO way of thinking like, Oh no, but I've got its aggro. I've, I've, I'm kiting. It's got to follow me. And I, no, it doesn't have to follow you. It doesn't have to do these things. And, and th in this particular one was a 
player who was trying to sort of theory craft their way around some kind of encounter with this idea that they could just do all the stuff and the enemy was just going to follow this sort of predetermined response, leaving out the fact that enemy could be intelligent, but even if it's an animal, the enemy could react in a bunch of ways which are not predetermined, right? But this is going to happen, I think, from the DM perspective too. You can get stuck in either what you've been doing or what you think they could do, or you're worrying about, like I said, meta constructs, like, oh, I, I don't want to take an opportunity attack. I don't want to lose these actions. So therefore I can only invest these actions in these limited things. I think players get there too, right? You're, you're the big fighter and you're hacking away at the creature and you want to do something else, but you're thinking if I do something else, I'm not going to lose my attack for the round because I'll be using my ax for something else. I got to move away, which means I'm going to take that opportunity attack. Therefore, and this is an honest parenthetical. This is why I don't really like opportunity attacks as a thing. So you start doing this calculus in your brain. And because that cost becomes too much, I don't want to lose the attack. I don't want to get the opportunity attack, whatever. I'm just going to sit and and just going to do what I've been doing, which puts you in this kind of static position. I think GMs get in that same kind of boat. And then it looks like there's no options. And then something like fudging dice comes in and says, look, no, the answer is to fudge your dice. And yes, that is a answer. But the an- other answer could be is just not to worry about that stuff too much. Don't. Who cares in this one encounter if the giant is going to lose an action so that they can do something cool or something else? Probably that something else ultimately is more interesting, exciting, cooler than just it's swinging with its club for the 50th time against the fighter who's just waiting for you to swing the club at it. When it could go do something else and have maybe a, a better, a much more of an impact on the encounter. The other thing I'll, I'll mention here is that this stuff is a lot easier if your creatures have goals that that consist of more than be fodder for an encounter. And what I mean by that is asking yourself this question, going back to the dragon. Why is the dragon here? Let's just add some more context. The uh, the party. Let's just let's just go right right to the heart of fantasy tropes. Right, the party has found a dragon's uh, abode. Their their horde. The dragons here. Their hordes here. The party has stumbled into stumbled into it. Like you know, like um, like Bilbo finding smog. So the party's here. They're here for the loot. This is the dragons bed chamber sleeping whatever they're the the center of their boat here they are so why is the party here that's clear they want to defeat the dragon take the loot why is the dragon here the dragon wants to defend its loot which you would think would say okay if it's going to defend its loot it's going to stay and fight sure it will up to a point but the dragon also doesn't want to die dragons are very smart they're very ancient creatures i'm sure they know that it's better to let a a particular horde go than to die with it. Perhaps they could do something else. I could see a dragon just saying, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to breathe. Let's say it's a fire breathing dragon, the good old classic red dragon. I'm just going to, I'm going to melt this stuff into slag. Let the party try to carry that out of here. And, you know, I'll come back, you know, I will note them. I will have smelled them all. I will find them and I will get my revenge and I will get back from them tenfold what they have taken from me. So if we have these motivations for the dragon, number one, defending your horde, but number two is staying alive because the horde's no good to you if you're dead and you can always get another hold horde. And like I said, you could try to do things to prevent the party from getting your horde on your way out. I just mentioned dragon breath, melt that stuff to just liquefy it. So it just becomes a big pool of, of, of gold and, and whatnot. And then, live to fight again so maybe you go through the first third of the combat and your goal is protecting your horde and you get to that third and it it doesn't have to be a hard number i'm not meaning to put a this many rounds before you change it's really more like we're talking about before you're getting a feel for it right you you as the gm and then you as the gm thinking for the dragon you're a couple rounds you're getting a feel for how hard these guys are to hit how powerful they are, how much damage they're doing. And you make that assessment either. I can, I I think I can win this or I don't think I can win this. And I would even put, if I think I can win it, but it's going to be super tight. I would put that into, you know what? I'm not going to take that risk. 
I'm old. I've lived thousands of years. I've lived thousands of years by not taking silly chances. And if I don't think I'm assured victory, then I'm probably going to say, you know what? I'm going to bow out. Maybe I'll see if I can really make their life hard for them. And if you're playing with lair actions or similar lair mechanics, you can play around with what might happen there, but I'm getting out. So then you've decided, okay, these things will change as you change your tactics. These things will naturally change the character of the combat. You started out, it might be fairly straightforward. The, uh, you know, the fighters walk up, the wizards hang back, right? And the dragon's making that assessment. Now, part of that might be, I don't want to be on the ground level with these fighters who are just encased in metal and are just waiting for me to sit there and thwack at it. Maybe that's where I take flight. Maybe that's where I try to dragon's breath, but over the fighters' heads and into that nice, more juicy, uh, succulent, you know, uh, back, back row of casters and, and support characters maybe i do something there and then as the combat's going on i'm making those thoughts on my turn as the dragon what am i doing what am i doing and i should continually be thinking to myself why am i doing this why am i doing this if i'm spending one more round hitting the fighter and i know it's not going to change anything i'm not going to drop the fighter i'm just going to be taking some off their hit points and it's not really doing anything then why am i doing that right you you know you think about what is that that definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. If I'm just thwacking this fighter and I know it's not effective, why am I doing it? That's what I need to think about as the dragon. Okay, this is not working or it's not working fast enough. Clearly, I'm not putting the fear of death into them. I'm not knocking them down fast enough. They're still here. They're still just giving me that, come on, come on, right? They're just, they're, they're just waiting and I'm just falling right into their plans. I mean, the party's plan there is, is to have, have this creature sit in front of their front line while the back line just can pelt away at them. So why am I doing it? If I don't have a reason, this stuff isn't, isn't making them leave. So it's not, it's not preserving my horde and I'm getting hurt. So I'm closer and closer to dying. I need to do something else. What would those things be? You know, I've already mentioned some things that they could be, you might think of some other things, obviously, whatever this particular creature is. And this is always a nice thing, if, especially with intelligent creatures, is to give them some different some different things, just some tools that don't even have to be necessarily combat tools, but it's those utility things that can really be helpful at a time like, time like this, in which you're not necessarily trying to directly damage them. You're not trying to say, okay, meteor swarm, but you might be trying to do, can I do... Um, you know, maybe if it's, uh, I, I think of the movie Dragon Slayer in which there was, uh, there was lava and, uh, you know, magma in the Dragon's Lair. Is there some spell or thing I might have, like, I don't know, transmute earth to mud, but you're in a kind of a lava pool. So that might all of a sudden you're, the, the party's singing in lava. Now, granted, that would hurt them, but it, or it could be something like, uh, I've got a water spell, but since I'm in this magma area, if I cast a water spell onto the lava, it's just going to make a bunch of steam which might hurt the party some if they're directly in it, but I'm really more thinking it's going to make a lot of mist and I can use that as a smoke screen to get away. Do I have a transportation type spell? Do I have a a teleport or misty step or dimension door, something else I could use to get out of there because now is the time where I need it. I kind of like those rings. You you can have them have a ring of something. I was just like, give that to guys rings of limited uses of, of, of teleport or things they could have kind of a, couple of get out of jail free cards if they if they manage to get it off but eventually they'll run out so that so they're not so they can't just constantly teleport like bowser out of uh super mario brothers that they have to you know at some point stand and fight or find another way to escape i know i'm about the escapes just as a general thing i like escapes i like the fact that they push encounters into areas that aren't super made for encounters it's one thing to always encounter folks in the rooms oh you're in the you're in the you're in the king's chamber and here here you are in the attack but what if you're trying to keep this combat going but it's a running combat and it's going through corridors and there are twists and turns people could try to close and block doors on you or there could be supporting forces that come out of side side passages and maybe you know that the king himself is just double dashing to get away but his other troops are clogging up the corridors and just trying to hold you back for a round 
just to keep letting that other individual get away. How as, as a party, how do you respond to that? You can't just do your normal or your standard march forward and attack because you do that. You're not, you're not winning at the encounter, assuming that your victory condition is capturing this or killing this person. So it forces you out of your comfort zone. Maybe the magic user who's kind of squishy and not built for front line, but he's got that teleport spell. Maybe he needs to try to get up front and just take that risk because he can make that distance in a jiffy past all the obstacles to get to that escaping king. But when they get to that king, they're exposed. So they're taking a risk, but the reward is that they'll be able to do this. And it would make a really cool moment if they did do it. But they could also just get hacked apart if you know that plan doesn't work but it really takes them out of their out of their out of their comfort zones i also think it kind of makes things seem more dynamic i kind of feel like the you go into a room and there's some bad guy in the room and then you kind of go through something and take down the bad guy it's kind of the, it gives me that kind of video game feel i mean that's what you do in, in in video games in video games you'll enter an area Often it's either a, a, a real or uh, they will create some kind of arena space. I always annoyed me where like you're, you're chasing the bad guy and, and, and you're chasing them, but really it's just little cut scenes of the bad guy running away and then you're left fighting normal guys. So you don't actually get to chase, so to speak, as you're just going down the corridors towards where you know the bad guy is going to stop running away. And you'll get in that area and there'll be some mysterious door that will just close and lock shut and be unopenable. Then then you'll be in that arena space where the actual encounter will be. I think we've taken to do a lot of that in, in our tabletop games and I don't know why because we don't need... I don't think we need to be held to that. Uh, it's kind of easier, I get it from a GM perspective, because you can have your map, you can find it, create it, and then you don't have to worry about the party leaving because you this, it's, you know, the whatever. Now you know this is my encounter area, but I think it's kind of boring, and I think the that boringness starts to force you to keep adding stuff. You got to keep adding. You got to keep oh, okay. I got to have multi. Uh, um, phases to my boss. I got to do stuff because none of these things change. Whereas if you just had it like, okay, this is open and there are three exits. The party's come through one. This guy's going to maybe see if he can do some damage or do something, but then he's going to try to jet out one of those side corridors or maybe just going to just run. I think that causes the party to be more on their toes, moving, moving. You got to, you got to keep going forward. You got to keep adapting your strategies. And the upshot of all of that is that I hope that to kind of bring this back around to the talk at the beginning, that there won't be this kind of doldrums part of the combat, or it will be very much reduced. I think it's okay if there's a couple of rounds in which you're kind of just holding steady, but that chess game should always be happening. To be fair, the players won't always see that chess game. And I know that I often see that part of that GM's comments or questions about how to get their players to think more tactically try to make better tactical decisions. And my answer usually is you, you really have to force them to do it. You can't expect them to make all these interesting tactical decisions if they're not necessary. The players are going to do a straightforward, whatever they think is going to work and kind of the minimum. If you can just stand there and hit a thing and it's going to go down, why am I going to try to do anything else? The reason why I might not, I mean, you could say, well, why not? And the reason why not is that if I have to add an, if I have to add a level of difficulty, an element of difficulty to whatever it is I'm doing, that's just a higher chance I'm going to fail. It's the difference between, okay, I can just stand and make an attack roll to just whack this guy, or I could try to do an acrobatic tumble and whack the guy. If I have to make a die roll, if I have to test my acrobatic tumbling skill in addition to making an attack roll, if there's not some great benefit to doing it, if you're not giving me I don't know, advantage on the damage or something that I think is substantial. Maybe that's not even substantial enough, but I'm not going to do it because now that just gives me two ways to fail. I had one way to fail before. Now I have two ways. And if I fail on the tumbling, who knows what other bad thing I might be inviting to happen. It might not just be that I miss, which is what happened. If I just make an attack roll, it might be that now I've missed. Now I'm flat on my back and the enemy has advantage or now I've lost my position or there's a number of other bad things that can happen. So if you don't force your party to contemplate these decisions, then they're not going to make them. They're not going to need to. 
So your job as a GM is to make sure that you are pushing your creatures maybe even more than you think they should to be dynamic, to be shifty, to be smart, to be, um, you know, flexible in their approach because that's going to force your party to adjust. The first time they see all of a sudden the guy does something else, all of a sudden that's really going to wake them up. Whoa, the guy's over there. He did this. He didn't just sit there waiting for me. Okay, now I got to figure out now, you know, let's say we're in a situation in which we need to do something other than kill the bad guys, which is always a good thing. It's always good if the party has a goal other than just kill the bad guys, right? In the dragon example, they're there for the horde, which does leave them open to negotiating with the dragon if they can get the horde. They don't have to kill the dragon, but you know that's maybe the easiest way to their goal, but it's not the only one. In the, in the same token, if they have goals other than kill the monsters, it gives them something else to root for. It also gives away another thing for the for the uh, enemies, their adversaries, to affect the encounter. For example, if they are trying to pull a switch that needs to be pulled for whatever reason, the switch of MacGuffining, they need to pull it, then the enemies can threaten that switch and make the party have to make a choice between, we need to pull that switch. The enemies between us and the switch, but now they're going to go potentially destroy the switch before, so it can't be pulled. I have to make a choice. I can't just sit and attack. We have to rescue the maiden. That guy's going to go over there and slit the maiden's throat or the prince or whomever. They're not just attacking me. I got to figure something out. So you, you want to give them, you, you, want your, you want your enemies to have their own goals. And hopefully the party is there for something other than, than killing. And again, that's, this is why I really like an OSR, that kind of treasure for XP. To me, that really gets people's brains thinking at least it has for my party and has in the in times I've played it. I don't know if there are, I can't speak for all parties and all tables, whether it works always, but I definitely, when uh, one of the things I've enjoyed watching with the players that I've been GMing a modified BX slash, you know, OSE game with is them really starting to appreciate and think in terms of how can we get the loot, which may not involve killing anything versus just, we need to kill monsters. So, you know, give your bad guys goals. Make sure the players have goals. Are they in this dungeon? Why are they in the, in the dungeon? Make, make that, uh, make that um, I don't want to say prize, make that goal something that isn't static and something that the, uh, the, the, the adversaries, either they're naturally aware of or they can be made aware of. And then that can be influenced and changed. If they need to capture a guy, put that guy on the move. What things happen? Let don't let the you know, and, and the upshot for combat is that kind of like I, what I was saying before about combat to me is interesting when it's in a lot of different places. It's not just in these big rooms. So in corridors, in you know, in in the woods, in these areas where the party isn't in a naturally advantageous position, it can force them to act. They can't just sit in the doorway and wait for the enemies to come to them and take advantage of the cover because while they're sitting in the doorway, the guy's going through the other door in the back. So they need to move. And that means they need to put themselves in harm's way. They can't sit in the doorway. They need to push forward, push forward. And what does that, if they have to push forward, what does that mean for them? They Maybe they can't do the optimal thing. The fighter can't plant himself and say, great, I'm going to go total defense. Uh, so that my party can do everything. No, I have to dash and I need to be open. I need to sit there and maybe take some opportunity attacks because I got to get forward. The magic users or the uh, support folks, I need to get forward. I need to get line of sight on the guy who's running away so I can't sit back there because I don't have line of sight. They ran behind the throne and they're leaving. I got to get line of sight. I got to be forward. And I'm just going to have to take the risk that some guy's going to run around a corner and pelt me because I have to get forward. So decisions, right? So this is decisions for your monsters. And I guess this is turning out to kind of a video about tactics and things, which is not quite where I started, but hey, that's, that's cool. Um, make sure your monsters have decisions and self-preservation is a, should be at the end of the day, their core decision. Granted, some things will just fight to the death just because, but I think that's more the exception to the rule. And of course, if you're like me, you can use 
uh, reactions and morale to kind of look at, well, how, how fanatical are these things in a given moment? But decisions for the monsters, self-preservation being the main one, but of course, what other goals do they have? Why are they here? Why are they fighting? Guards don't just sit somewhere just to sit somewhere. They're guarding a place for a reason. And if it looks like their position is going to be overrun, they're probably going to try to back up. And as, whoa, I, I, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that name. All right, I guess I'll try to bite Wenashki underscore PL notes. Morale rolls are perfect for this. Yes, they are. Guards are guarding places for a reason. You're, you know, if you have some folks guarding the door to the room and it looks like you're going to overrun, they should probably back up into the room to A, warn the people in the room that they're getting overrun, B, potentially get a better position. If you're on that far side of the door, you can get cover, you can stab out at things, you can force people to come through the door into your space. It's just better than being on the outside of the door. And then if the cause is lost, then it's time to run away, help other folks run away, do these kind of things. Rarely, I think, should guards just sit there and get just hacked to pieces if they have a chance to reply. Yeah, if you're there and you get a surprise, the first round, they're surprised and you just hack them apart. That's going to happen. But if they have a chance and they know the cause is lost, they're going to react to that. They're not going to just keep fighting. And then your players should have goals. I don't like the gun dungeon. There are a couple of dungeon concepts I just am not a fan of. One is the you're just there to clean it out, to clean it out. And I know that has, there are certainly times where it makes sense. The goblins have been threatening the kingdom for centuries. It's time to send in a team to wipe them out. Go wipe them out. I kind of like to add a little nuance, things like that. We need to try to convince the goblins to leave or whatever. And usually that can, part of that convincing can be, yeah, we got to show them that we're going to, their choices are leave or wipe them out. And they're only going to believe that if we wipe some, we got to show them we're serious, right? It's kind of that. Not that this is necessarily uh, what you should be thinking, but you know that kind of thing. Of, well, we got to punch him in the mouth to show them that we're serious, and then we can negotiate, kind of thing, right? Or we got to go in to get something. The goblins have kidnapped the daughter of the local lord, so we got to go find the daughter and bring them out. Those are the kind of goals I like better. The sort of actionable, actionable goals that that um, have them moving through a dangerous place, but their goal isn't just clean the dangerous place, and they may want to. Because maybe that's like a the abandoned keep that they can inherit if they can clean out. That's fine, but I'm, that's not their primary goal. And if the the goblins who are holed up in the abandoned keep were there because they had kidnapped the daughter and they lose, they're going to leave, and then they can have the keep anyway. Uh, I don't like the kind of you know just clean them out to clean them out. So if the party has goals and your monsters have goals and they are at least somewhat aware of each other, it makes sense that when the party shows up at the abandoned keep. The goblins or whomever are going to be pretty aware that, okay, they're coming for the daughter, right? We we told them not to send anybody, but they did. So now we can threaten the daughter, try to escape somewhere else, do things that the party can deal with. And these are all essentially ingredients of kind of dynamism or because they invite strategic and tactical thinking. If you're the party and you have been tasked with rescuing the Lord's daughter, when you get to the keep, I might be thinking about, you might, you might not, but I might be thinking about, well, what if they try to escape? We need to try to figure out we're a party of five, so we can't surround the castle, but maybe we can look at where are the back doors and front doors. And is there an easy way out that, that is not obvious? Is there a hidden way in? Because on these kind of missions, secrecy is usually the key, the element of surprise. You're sending in the guy to try to sneak in to get the princess. If the the captors are aware from jump that you are coming to rescue the princess, what might they do? Run away, kill the princess. Neither one of those is a good outcome. So does it make sense if you're a party there to rescue a princess that you just bust in through the front door and just go room to room hacking and slashing? No, it doesn't. But that oftentimes ends up being what the adventure is about. I would say to you, if you're the GM, the first time they do that, and either A, the party, the the bad guys just go out a back door, or B, they slit the princess or prince or whomever, the, the kidnapped person's throat, and leave them there in a pool of their own blood with a note saying, next time pay the ransom, or you know, don't be foolish, then beyond just the consequences in the fiction, they're going to think really hard about 
next time what they're, what are they what are they going to do and i guarantee they're going to hate those goblins <laughs> they're going to hate those goblins and they that might be another interesting thing is maybe those goblins become somebody that the party's going to go after because if if i've seen anything in my days of playing and running in games is players don't like to be sort of outmatched thwarted whatever or even just bad luck against a an npc they are going to hold a grudge and want to get back and get one over i know if i've done something foolish or whatever or something's happened and the npc's an npc has gotten over on me i'm always thinking i want to get one back over on that npc so if you want to build up some sort of organic bad guys that's a great way that's a great way to do it whoo so i've been going on for whew, about and oh, well about 50 minutes now on the topic and i know i've i've sort of rambled maybe a little bit but that's my way but the, you know those are the things those are the things that I think about, I really, I, I haven't read, I know there's that, the site and that book, I think it's called what the monsters know what they're doing. I have not read it. I have not looked at the blog. I'm sure it's got great stuff. I actually started, had a couple of videos a long time ago where I was going to do a whole series on, on tactics and I kind of let it slip. Maybe I'll um, bring it back at then. The kind of issues I think on, on this case really. So there was the, originally was the kind of the meta concern of how do you short circuit an encounter that's becoming boring which then morphed into a whole talk about tactics. I guess if I was just kind of kind of bring this all back up and put a bow on it, what I hope if you go back and watch this would, would be maybe the idea of that you can, that really it's about injecting strategy and tactics everywhere you can into an encounter. And those things will prevent it from being boring because they just give you a lot of tools, mental tools and things you should be thinking about fictional tools in that you're, you're giving things that are being fought over that can be moved around the board. If you think about all kinds of movies where, you know, there's a, there's the item, the MacGuffin thing that people can have, and it's being thrown all over. What in, in that was, which Avengers movie, the second Avengers movie, the one with Thanos, right? Where they got the glove or they're trying to get the glove off and it's being thrown around, passed around, right? They're trying to figure out, get it to where it needs to be before Thanos can get to it. That stuff's really fun. I don't know that you see that in a lot of say D and D kind of situations. Is it because we can't do it in the game? No, of course we can, but oftentimes it's easier just to throw guys in a room. But when you just throw guys in a room, then a lot of either, either you do run the risk of it becoming boring because there's just guys in a room or you have to start, trying to think about all these different ways to layer up guys in the room. How can I make guys in the room different? I got to make the space has to be crazy. The guys have to have crazy powers. They have to have round to round. Everything's got to be going in a kaleidoscope of colors. And not that that stuff can't be fun, but man, that's a hard act to keep up encounter after encounter game after game. I remember a, a long time ago, again, now I was on Reddit, I think, and somebody had posted this encounter they wanted to do. And this was like a level one, Kind of, I don't even think it was the, the the ultimate encounter of their session or their adventure, and it was going to take place inside this in, inside. I think it was a um, what do you call it? a a, uh, a, a, a a not a water wheel, but a windmill, and it had all kinds of gears and conveyor belts, and there's all kinds of stuff, and all this crazy stuff is going to happen. And on this round, this was going to happen. On this round, that was going to happen, and it was just going to be this kind of craziness. And look, on its own, it's like, wow, that's pretty impressive. Just as a design, just forgetting everything else about it, you go just, wow, that's that's a lot of thought being put into the encounter. But one, it's half the stuff didn't make sense in the context. Okay, it, it was it, this was a windmill. And I get that there might be gears in a windmill. Why there were kind of sci-fi style conveyors and other things, kind of danger things and all this. OSHA would be all over that thing. It just doesn't make any sense. So you 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 start coming with things that are to make it interesting in a meta way, but you're you're losing you're losing that cohesion in your setting because you're just starting to make things that when you step back from your setting a little bit, you kind of you stop looking at it in terms of I got to make this encounter interesting. You just look at it in terms of how does it fit in your in your world, and it just doesn't because like I, I don't know I'm playing a low magic world, but suddenly I've got conveyor belts and all kinds of craziness inside a mundane windmill. Like what what am I doing? And then how do you go up from there? If this is your kind of level one, 
you know, an intro encounter and let's say they love it and you love it, but now it's okay. Do it again. You got another, you got another session coming up in a week. Do it again. And maybe you think oh, I could do it again. I can, I can raise the stakes. Great. How many sessions are you planning on playing? How many? Yes. Fluffy the Griffin, the windmill mega factory. I mean, it really was. I mean, you looked at this person's thought process in the windmill and it was really incredible, all this stuff to make this encounter, but it's just not, a, it's just bottom line. It's not sustainable. You can do this for a week. You can, maybe you can pull it off for a month, but if you think you're going to run a long-term campaign and being additionally being able to do that without it, a just becoming too much. B I think you just, at some point you just lose that cohesion with your setting. And at some point the players are going to walk in and just be like, I don't, like this doesn't make sense to me. Like, what are we doing? Why are we, why are we here? Are we in the simulate? You know, are we in that Rick and Morty episode where they're continually being thrown into simulations of simulations because things are just getting out of out of hand? It just becomes something that you just can't ground yourself in anymore. It's just you just I think you just reach a, a threshold, and maybe you would say, "Well, I love Gonzo stuff, so there is no threshold." Fair enough, but for me, I just reach a point where I, just, I don't, I can't make heads or heads or tails of it. It becomes a ton to manage. And it just, it just isn't sustainable. Whereas if you try to really think in terms of goals and strategy and tactics, what are these creatures fighting for? How badly do they want it? What will they do to achieve it? Or what will they do to stop the players from achieving it? What are those? And you start putting all this stuff together. I feel like you end up with something that's a lot more manageable because it's going to be grounded in the fiction. Why are these creatures doing things? They're doing things because of the stuff, things are happening around it. It's going to be in the context of the game. Why are the goblins doing what they're doing? It's because they're trying to get money. That's why they've, they've, uh, you know, they've kidnapped the the son or daughter of, of the of the local lord. That's why they got it. Why are they going to cut bait? Because ultimately, they're not here because they're fanatics. They're mercenary. They're not going to just stay and die just to stay and die. At the same time, they're not just going to let the the kid go because of nothing they need to make their own point which is we need to be taken seriously so they're going to try to kill that person if it becomes clear that the lord's not paying up and they've sent some band of killers into or, you know to rescue right so you automatically have those things they're in conflict players want the princess the goblins don't want them to have the princess one way or another and uh, oops we got something else in here Let's see. None, nothing says GMs trying to emulate video games is a mistake. I agree. Video games do the things they do because they can't make interesting natural scenes. We can't exactly. And we're not, we're not stuck with a finite amount of assets. We have our brains. We have our imaginations. I know not everyone is going to be on the same level as not everyone's an improver by nature or by design, but we have, we have a whole universe to play with. Whereas Obviously, video games, as well as adventure books and other things, have limits. They just have a number of pages. They have a finite amount of room for content. We don't. Joel Anderson says, the encounters I make for my game will be played exactly once. Uh, right. The, the role-playing games are not MMOs. That's exactly the other thing, right? They can be a very bespoke uh, situation because, yeah, you're not repeating it 100 times. And you can play it differently. And even if it was a module that you were going to sell or you're going to run it at conventions over and over again... You each moment can just be its own thing for that particular group. That moment in time, it's not being run millions of times for millions of things. Uh, Fluffy the Griffin says, Gonzo is fine when it puts all back into the fancy, but it's fantasy, but there's a limit where it kills the immersion. I totally agree. And I think everyone's threshold for Gonzo is going to vary. Um, I'm, I'm big on like, I like Gonzo for like one shots. One shots, I, I bring on the crazy. I think. Just for me personally, my taste when I'm running campaigns or I'm in campaigns, I like things to be more grounded. I think it can be harder to figure out what's going on and really set your feet. Because I'm not just talking as a GM. I talk about this stuff. This is stuff that I also like to think about. And I appreciate being having the ability to think about it and not only think about these kind of things like the strategy, the tactics, but that I know that thinking about those things will be rewarded. And I find sometimes with the Gonzo stuff, it's just not because there is that point where the unpredictability of the setting just undermines being able to do a lot of planning. And I, I like randomness. Uh, I like randomness, but I like some kind of predictability. I like that 
things that I don't expect will happen, but I like having an idea of how often that might happen. What are the odds that that might happen, right? So random encounters in the wilderness are fine because yes, you could run into anything at any time, but I know that it's where I am in the wilderness is going to, I can count on. Okay. I'm in the hills. That tells me something about my likelihood to see anything versus I'm in the city. So I could still make decisions based on a predictability of things, even though there's chance involved. Whereas with Gonzo, I think at some point you run into the fact that yeah, chance is just way up here and I, I can't, I can no longer bridge that gap. And so I just kind of, I just check out a little bit because I can't count on things. If it's just going to suddenly rain sausage for no reason. And then uh, I'm, I'm, and then, you know, moon men are going to appear out of a portal and, and all this stuff's going to happen. And the, 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 you know, the, 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 the streets are going to run with, with sludge and there's just no rhyme or reason to it, then I'm not going to care so much. Right. Um, thanks everyone for joining. I wanted to wrap this around an hour, which I'm at right now. Um, if anyone's got any last things I'd like to throw in the chat to talk about before I, I, I hit, hit the end button, but I really appreciate everyone coming in on list and listening. I may try to do these more often. I feel like I can usually scrape together an hour here or there during the day. And if I find that folks are tuning in and, and, and I have stuff to say, or at least are there folks around who we can throw things back and forth over, that is great. But I really just wanted to talk about that, um, that, that parable of the interesting dragon encounter. And if you, if you missed that flip back to the beginning of the stream, where I talked about it, but um, yeah, thanks so much for joining everyone. And, you know, feel free to drop me a line. You can see I got the link, the, hold on, I'm kind of, there you go. The link uh, on Twitter, or you can throw comments in the videos or wherever. If you have stuff that you would like me to talk about or address, I'm always fishing for topics and what folks are interested in. Um, Joel Anderson says, please do more of these. This has been fun. Great. Uh, I'm, I'm glad. Um, um, that's that's all I need to hear. If people enjoy doing it, um, then I will keep doing it. Uh, I'll just throw out a reminder: if you enjoy this stuff, one other thing you can do is subscribe to the channel. If you're not already, I don't, I can't see who's actually in the chat, so I don't know if it's folks who are already all subscribed. But just in for those who may come across this later, hey, if you like the stuff, subscribe. Um, I do have a Patreon and a Ko-Fi coffee. I always say Ko-Fi because I see code dash fi. Anyway, there. If you want to help. Uh, sort of crowdfund my efforts. There are ways to do that as well. Um, hit the thumbs up. That always helps. Uh, Fluffy, the Dra Fluffy the Griffin. I don't want to say Fluffy the Dragon. Fluffy the Griffin. This was fun. I'm sad I missed it. Hey, um, I'm sorry you missed it too, but please go back and watch and I'll, you know hit, hit up anything and, and just use the comment section and I'll try to get to it. I'll respond or maybe in another stream. Oh, uh, another comment. Very cool stream. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Anyway, I will sign off for now. I will see you around. Have a great rest of your day. Game on. Cheers, everyone.